talk about international education, um, starting with the thought that the word international is actually much used, though perhaps actually little thought about. And I feel I can't actually start this without saying something about Paris, um, as these you know, terrifying acts of terrorism and chaos unfold. It seems to me that there is an even greater need for an, an education that will allow and encourage young people to think about their role in dealing with the crises that our world has. Um, so I just, um, I don't need to be sombre, but I think it's worth just you know, having that in the back of our minds. Now you're thinking about choosing schools, um, choosing an environment for your children as they grow up, choosing an ethos, a set of attitudes. And I think it's like, quite interesting just who I'm talking to. Um, I was like just a quick survey to begin with. I do this with my students when they start the year. But you know, hands up who was born out of the UK sitting right here. Oh, loads of us, excellent. Um, or spouse was as well, maybe one or more of the family. Parents somewhere else. We're quite a, yeah. Um, who's worked or lived or been educated abroad, partly? Yeah, okay, a lot of us too. Uh, who speaks another language really fluently? Amazing. Seven eggs is your place, I need to say no more. Um, and you know, who of us thinks our children will work um, some of their working life abroad or talking in another language to the people they work with? Yeah, I mean, I sort of rest my case. I do this little survey with the 11 year olds who join the school and I find growing numbers like you will raise their hands to these questions with interest and enthusiasm. In fact, we quite often talk in more than one language. I can manage a sentence in quite a few. You know, How many languages do you speak? Not very many is my answer, but they do. When we use that word international at seven notes, we mean it of all our students. Our approach is everyone is an international citizen. We live in a world composed of many nations. Um, and it's not some other people who come here. So all of us feel that. And I think it's probably worth saying, to get a little bit of argument between some of the other schools, most of these big, old, famous British public schools cap their number of OEC students. And at seven notes, we just think this is wrong. You know, that it's not about numbers and quotas and preserving national identity. It's about embracing the plurality of the world and letting these young people grow up together. Now, I'm going to just talk about two strands of what I think an, education, an international education might be. Um, and those are what I call the in invisible education that goes on when you're just with people from other cultures. Um, the bit that you can't really measure or assess, but we see happening on a daily basis at our school. And the second one, which probably is easier to sort of identify, an international curriculum, in our case, the International Baccalaureum and its impact. And then I hope there'll be lots of time for some questions and, and discussions. But on that sort of how we learn from each other invisibly with who's around us, one of my favorite um, remarks from an old Seven Oaks student that I met a year or two ago at a reunion, in fact, in Kuala Lumpur, said, do you know, I had a student from a different continent as my roommate every term at school. Every term, a different continent sharing my room. I just think you can't, there's, there's no substitute for that first-hand experience of just living, working, socialising with people from all over the place. And a more recent example, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a really quite astonishing production of something called The Golden Key. It was a drama production actually devised by our drama staff and students, based on Grimm's fairy tales, transposed to two places in the modern world, Disney's uh, Hollywood and Lebanon of the 70s. And this is a creation of German folk tales interwoven with different periods in 20th century history, uh, performed mainly in English, but partly in German, with no subtitles, with some of our German students from our German partner exchange school. And I just mentioned that as a kind of example of what I call the invisible learning, doing real imaginative, exciting projects with students from elsewhere. This production toured Germany to German-speaking audiences. And I think that experience, you can't really sort of replicate it through books or even online. So this lived experience of other cultures. Um, and of course that permeates the classroom, it permeates the uh, daily life at school. So I say, imagine studying Shakespeare with someone reading 
Shakespeare's plays in their third language, as was the case with one of my students in my very first year at Seven Oaks, a girl who was Latvian, her first language Latvian, her second language Russian, her third language English, and you know, she put some of the native English speakers to shame with her understanding. Imagine studying mathematics with students from countries with sky-high mathematics ratings, students from Singapore, Hong Kong, Croatia, Hungary. Imagine discussing the causes of World War I with students from Germany, from Russia, from America. Imagine being part of our Middle Eastern debating society with students from Turkey, from Israel, from Nigeria, from Ukraine. Imagine being in an environment where there is no prevailing worldview, where a teenager can realise why he or she might take one particular political or moral or cultural stance and then actually realise there may be many other views that might also be right, have currency. Imagine being in an educational environment where discussion really is a broadening of the mind, and an opening of the world view, where inventive approaches to conflict resolution can be discussed. And then kind of transpose that to what you all know um, are the needs and realities of the modern workplace with its diverse cultural mix um, and the benefits, indeed the need for such an education become absolutely clear. You know, we very much see our young people being educated to contribute to that society, um, to contribute nationally and globally. Um, I don't know if you saw the report from um, the HMC conference where the head of UCAS, Mary Kernock Cook, was reported as saying, our young people in these private schools are sleepwalking into traditional jobs. Absolutely not at Seven Oaks. There's a very, very sort of open view of what the world is and how they might participate in it. And our um, student body you know, is made up of about 50 different nationalities. Um, everyone is fluent in English. Um, so there's no kind of communication breakdown, but many will speak in other languages. And incidentally, we do provide quite a lot of bilingual languages support. So that's the kind of cultural milieu of the Seven Oaks International Education. What about the international curriculum itself, the International Baccalaureate Diploma Programme, which, as Charles said, we've taught at Seven Oaks since 1978. The IB's almost 50 years old, um, it's a smidgen younger than me, and going just as strong, um, and Seven Oaks is probably the most experienced IB school in, in the UK. Um, there's a lot of information available in the public domain, so I won't give you all the facts about it, but in a nutshell, you study six subjects, something from each area of the curriculum. You undertake a significant research project independently. You follow a course called Theory of Knowledge, which is a kind of ethics critical thinking course, and you give unexamined, untested hours to activities in the creative sphere, in physical action, outdoor education, and really important to us, community service. Um, so all our students are studying a language that isn't ours. They're all engaged in some kind of international um, learning experience. For example, all students study a science. They have to do a science project which connects all the science disciplines. And we've embarked on a way of doing it um, through Skype and FaceTime with several schools all over the world. So our students are interacting on projects about you know, water conservation worldwide um, for some of their um, science courses. Um, just before I finish, a word about sort of where all this gets you then. You know, does it still work for the basic things that it's going to university? Uh, yes, of course. We have two, over 200 graduating students every year. Um, I should say they are getting exceptionally strong IB results. The IB is marked on a scale up to 45 points. Is it, did anyone do the IB sitting here, actually? I won't ask you your schools, but if you, if you did it, you know that 45 points is kind of pretty special. Um, about, only about 100, 150 of the sort of, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of IB students worldwide achieve this. And Seven Oaks is the proud supplier of 10% of the world's top IB performers. So, of course, they go to strong universities. Uh, a large proportion to UK universities, but some of you might have had the question in the last session, what about the US, what about elsewhere? Seven Oaks is the largest supplier of British educated sixth formers to US universities in the UK. We send someone to MIT yearly, several to Stanford, Yale, Harvard, Brown, 
Cornell, Columbia, you name it. We have a specialist department to lead this area. We're a registered SAT center. So our approach to higher education is genuinely global. And actually a small number of our students will study in Europe and in Asia too. So our outlook on higher education is thoroughly international. So, I mean, really what we're about at Seven Oaks is providing this kind of shared education experience that goes across continents. I like to call it Education Sans Frontières. Um, I think our students have tremendous variety, but also tremendous consistency. And I also like when I'm feeling subversive, which is quite often, um, that the IB graduate is really the old Etonian of the future, a truly educated international network of world citizens, a global network of friends, and above all, you know, young people who will really make things happen and contribute to a world which needs people with that kind of diverse, balanced worldview. So I'll shut up there. I'm very pleased to take your questions on, on what I said. I was actually talking yesterday to a group of YPO people at a forum in Oxford and a woman said, how do you compare them? And I'm afraid I just said, you can't compare them. Actually, they're incomparable. The IB is an educational program, a curriculum, a philosophy, a mission-driven educational vision, which also qualifies people for higher education and the workplace. A-levels are a set of exams devised by government education departments. So they are totally different, conceptually, they're totally different things. In practice, what that means is if you're an A-level student, you study three or four randomly selected courses and you take a number of very closed kinds of target-driven tests at the end, essentially. If you're doing the IB, you're studying a balanced program which requires math, English, a science, a modern foreign language, or indeed an ancient language, a humanities subject, and doing these other elements that I've talked about. Yes, with exams at the end, also with coursework, but it's a baccalaureate, it's a diploma um, total qualification, not something that's put together by components. The, the, IB sum, the IB whole is much greater than the sum of its parts, and you couldn't really say that about A-levels. Well, I, I, actually, just before I came up here, I was hanging my coat downstairs, and a nice lower sick girl was putting it away and asked me what I was talking about. And I told her, I said, oh, I wish I'd done the IB. My sister did it. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. I think that people who've done the IB, I mean, our former students who I meet, you know, routinely, these people are doing really interesting things with their lives. They're falling on their feet. They're fun to talk to. Um, there is no one that I've met who's done the IB has regretted it. I mean, there are some people here, so correct me if I'm wrong. And maybe you weren't taught it well enough if you do. But Everyone that I know who's done it, however demanding the course, it is hard work, there's no point in pretending that, has found us to them in really good stead. And looking to the future, the IB is growing, but internationally it's growing in double digits. I was actually on the board of the IB, it's an educational charity, and it's set itself up for global growth. The reason why I'm asking yeah. you, you've got a perspective um, coming there. Good, nice to see you. Don't be embarrassed, he's fine, don't worry about your dad. Uh, and she's going, um, so she's doing a GCSE yeah. this year, so deciding whether to do IB or A double block, I mean, how, how would you sell IB? Well, I just tried, and then I know it's worked or it hasn't. Um, I can't do the decision for you. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you something else a bit kind of subversive. My husband's a professor at King's College London and in the humanities, and he always goes, these A-level students, I consider them as students with disabilities. That's a terrible thing to say. The IP students are just so much better equipped to think, to write, to read. I mean, I, I met the head of Knoxville College the other day, just said, bring them on. You know, these people can write. Another question. Thank you. Yeah. Again, this makes Seven Oaks almost unique in the UK, which is shocking if you come from an international background, in that all our students at Seven Oaks study three sciences until they're 16, and then all study one or two sciences for the IB. With the IB, you can take two subjects from any of the subject areas where there are options. So we send about 
um, more between a third and a half of our students will study a STEM subject at university. About 20 will do medicine. We send 12 to Imperial every year and many to do engineering at Cambridge. And the profile for those students is maths, physics, chemistry, higher level. So sometimes people think with the idea it's all a bit arty, they do a language. That's actually not so. Um, it's a very strong science um, option and the high level sciences are extremely challenging actually. Uh, there's a slight difference with the um, A-level and some, in some other countries in that uh, mechanics is part of physics with the IB, not part of maths. But you know, that's how we, we work around it. So uh, does that give you enough technology? Okay, so there are some technology courses, but the T, so I didn't really even attend to that because that's just woven through all these courses, it's embedded in the structure of IB programs, so a lot of the work is done online, and we're actually building a new science and technology centre which will bring all these disciplines together more successfully. Uh, well, we, we, you can do compute. We, we, we don't. We often design technology as a science subject. It's not a. We don't. We don't concentrate on it as a separate subject very much. It's ever notes. Uh, well, I think the EB is probably even harder than the IB. The EB is very, very niche, so I hope you're impressed I actually know what it is. Probably most people don't. It's the European Baccalaureate. I think you have to do more languages with the EB. Um, I, th I, you know, I think the EB is so minority, I'm not sure if it has a strong future in this country, actually, so I, I can't really compare it in detail. It's not our territory. I think it's probably been superseded by the IB. Uh, we think, well we know, we've done some statistics on this, our IB students are much more likely to get Oxford and Cambridge interviews than an A-level student performing at a similar level, if so I mean, because universities recognise the breadth and depth of the IB, the demands it makes on you know, intellectual agility, and it's not, they, they know it's more than just a qualification. Um, internationally, it's, it's extremely well regarded. The American universities um, like it a lot. Obviously, you have to do the SAT, so it's not, it's not a, um, just a qualification on its own. But US universities are particularly in tune with the culture of the IB. But British universities are adjusting fast. You know, there's been a big rise in these multidisciplinary university degrees in the London colleges, the arts and sciences degree at UCL, for example, um, the new College of the Humanities, which is developing kind of courses across subject disciplines. We, I mean, you asked a question about the future and, and universities and what they will require over time. Uh, we are absolutely certain that the world needs people who don't divide into scientists or artists or humanities people and technologists. That the really important people in the future are going to understand how, dis across the disciplines, how these things work and how they join up. So I don't think anyone can lose with an IB qualification for the foreseeable future. I really don't. Globally, the profile of the IB is completely different from the profile here. The question you've asked here wouldn't be asked in European contexts for IB schools or in the Asian or American contexts for IB schools. In the US, the IB and its three programs, actually also the fourth program, have been adopted in some really challenging school districts, bits Chicago, parts of Miami, to transform educational achievement for low achieving underprivileged children. So it's kind of, it, it, it's genuinely able to deal with, as it were, people with learning challenges and, you know, really scholarly, clever children. <laughs> And that's because the grade range is really huge, and the kind of flexibility within what you actually do for your diploma program is also big. And I should say, you know, I'm at a school where the average is 39, the world average is 30. And at Seven Notes, we have quite a lot of students. You know, we're not quite as super selective as it might come across from the results. We have probably 10 or 20 students who get from 30 to 34 points every year. For us, that's low, for the world, that's high and they will still go to universities you've heard of, you're proud to have your child at. So, yes, is the Can answer. I just ask a follow-up to that, yeah. which is, if I had children, or we had children who aren't at the top strata academically, but wanted to do the IB, yeah. uh, 
where could we do that in the UK? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, so, you know, there, there are a range of really good boarding schools that do a combination of IBNA level. You know, I think you should look at Oakham, Haybury, Brentwood, uh, Arding Life, and, you know, more than, I think it's a bit less selective than Seven Oaks, but really good places. Um, and then there are, of, you know, there are a number of day schools in London that also take it on. The Girls, the Girls, King's Wonder Learning, that's been selected too. Um, and some of the international schools, you know, South Bank School or um, the American Community Schools. You know, there's a very diverse portfolio of schools. And quite a lot of state schools also do the IB. It's half and half in this country. People think it's private and elite. Not so. So, yes, there is a range. Thank King at the St. Edward's Oxford, another very good place to take issue a little bit with this kind of you've got to find the right school for the right child. I think it's quite simple. If you really like a school and want to go to it and you basically satisfy its academic entry requirements, then it's the right school for you. There's no magical scientific formula for it. We said we don't have a type at Seven Oaks. We are really dedicated to educating people as they are, not into what they should turn into, which I think again is a more kind of traditional public school you've got, you know, make a man of your son. We, we don't do it like that. Um, so, you know, we want children who are bright, we say above average, um, you know, that just means quite good at school. Uh, we love having people who are enthusiastic about music or sport or drama, and, you know, if they're really good at it, even better, but we're an inclusive kind of school, we want people to join in. And actually, really important to us, we like people who are going to be kind of good members of the school community. Who are, uh, you know, I'm told the word nice is one you're not meant to use. We like nice children at school, kind, warm-hearted people who will just join in and, and be nice friends to the other people in the school. Uh, it's not totally relevant to the tariff system is the honest answer because selective universities don't use the UCAS tariff. This is the thing where you know an A level gets 150 points or whatever it is and so I, to be honest I couldn't recite to you the UCAS tariff. Universities make their offers for the IB in the total diploma points score. So um, Oxford will make an offer of 39 to 40 points, that's its average. Cambridge is a bit higher, 40 to 42 points. Durham, depending on the course, let's say 36 to 38 points. Um, and yes, we find that works very well. We don't really take people in at year 11. Um, we do sometimes take people in at year 10 and sometimes at year 8 if a place comes up. It is pretty important to be fluent in English to join the school, so that we, we're not designed for people who don't really know English. We have some learning English support, but they need to be a very quick study to catch up. We, we have taken people with not that great English, but it's unusual. Uh, I wouldn't say so, that all the research about student-teacher ratio shows that class size is the least important factor in school success and that quality of teacher and environment is more important. But our class sizes for the IB, the average is 10. They might go up to 15 if someone makes a last minute change. And we might run a class as small as four or six, but yeah, there is quite a high ratio as it happens, but I don't think that's the reason for our success. Uh, interesting question. No, I mean, I think this is this whole less is more and what counts as curriculum content. And the IB actually has very heavy curriculum content, um, but the approach to it is rather different to the A-level system. I mean, you know, I was an A-level fact, well, he didn't do A-level, but I taught this fellow GCSE many years ago, um, and he could have done A-level English. Um, so I've taught A-level English for years, and the IB, I actually do teach it myself for the last 12 years. So actually, you study more books for English higher level than you do for A level. Um, you don't do them line by line. And sometimes English teachers like that. I've liked it, you know, really teasing it through. You teach the text and you get students to think about poets, not what is the answer to a question about Hamlet that might come up. So it's a much more open and challenging and much more liberating for students and teachers. So it's not diluted, it's, it, it, it's more grown up. More mature, 
more important to us actually is making good classes that are, we're more likely to move someone for kind of social reasons than ability. We want the classes to kind of gel as well as they can. Uh, but, but setting in subjects like maths and a language where it's very incremental, like you can't do the next bit if you haven't done the first bit, we do a bit. But in English, it's not like that. You might get one bit of a poem but not another, but that's not necessarily better or worse. So that, that's our approach. So just to lead on, yeah. you're, that, you're quite an unusual school in that respect, aren't you? Uh, if you school. say so, I haven't actually done a statistical comparison of that. I think we... So, I mean, streaming was something that I think streaming is something from the maintained sector, from comprehensive education, where you wanted to get good results and you couldn't differentiate skillfully as a teacher between a really good student and a not such a good class. And we just don't see it like that at our school. We have a more inclusive and determined approach. <laughs> <laughs>